Hello friends, this is going to be the lecture on social stratification and poverty. There are no really announcements today as pertaining to our class. All the counties that I teach in, so no matter where you're listening from, um, now have at least one confirmed case of COVID-19. So please just shelter in place, stay home as much as you humanly can, um, wash your hands for 20 seconds with warm water. And please pay attention to yourself. The symptoms come on very, very quickly. So please take care of yourself at this time. To get started for this lesson, there are three videos that I want you to watch. If you are listening to this via the video link, go ahead and download the PowerPoint and you'll be able to click the links on there. If you don't want to download the PowerPoint or for some reason can't, I have the names of the videos up there and the links. So you can type them in long form if you really wanted to, or just type in crash course and then the corresponding episode. Um, you need to watch these so that you can answer the reflection questions for this week. There are other reflection questions um, that I'll be personally going over in this lecture, but these videos, um, since we can't be um, together and do activities to explain what's going on are the next best thing for you. You need to pay close attention to them. They're going to explain and like set up the lecture. So go ahead and pause the lecture here and watch these videos and answer those corresponding reflection questions. Remember that these questions are due on April 5th. Now that you have watched those videos and understand what stratification is, we need to talk about what poverty is and the impacts that it has on our global society and on the people around us. So the definition of poverty is technically just a state or condition where a person lacks the financial resources um, to maintain like the essentials in life. So like food, shelter, water, um, psychological needs. But that is a very, very broad definition and could potentially apply to pretty much anyone who's not in the 1%, right? Um, so we need to talk about the different definitions of poverty, who gets to decide what poverty is, and what that can mean for people in poverty. One definition of poverty is the federal poverty line. We're going to be talking about this um, for a while and focusing on this because this is not a stratification course. Um, this is the one that we're going to talk about most, but it is not the only one. However, it may arguably in America be the most important definition of poverty. So the FPL or the federal poverty line is the definition that the government has to measure poverty. Um, why is their definition the most important? It's because it decides who gets subsidies, who gets benefits, who gets programs. Um, what the government decides is poor gets to decide um, who gets help and who can be lifted out of poverty and who can have tax breaks and who can uh, basically have the chance to struggle to survive. However, there are a lot of problems with FPL. Um, almost nobody agrees that it's a good measurement. We're going to talk about uh, why and how that happened. So there are a ton of problems with the FPL. You could probably spend weeks on how problematic this measurement is and how it doesn't come close to actually measuring poverty in America. We do not have a full semester to talk about how awful this measurement is. So I'm going to give you the top highlights. These are not all the criticisms. You could probably buy on your own come up with some more. Um, but we're going to talk about some of the major ones. The first bullet point here points out that um, it doesn't really do anything to measure the economic need of people. So as you saw on the last slide, um, there, there was like a line and everyone below that line um, is considered in poverty by the American government standard, but that doesn't really tell you how deeply they're in poverty. Are they $1 into poverty? Are they 50% below the poverty line? Are they struggling to make rent? Do they not have food? Are they choosing between medicine and food? Um, so this doesn't, this doesn't really talk about how deep in poverty people are, which is arguably pretty important if you are using this measure to decide who gets help and what kind of help and how much help they get. Um, so first of all, this like baseline does not talk about what people actually need when they're in poverty. The second bullet point on here, um, the line is so outdated. We're going to talk about why in a second. 
Um, but the line doesn't reflect what you actually need um, to survive. So it does not talk about taxes. It doesn't talk about work expenses like work shoes or uniforms if you're in the service industry. It doesn't talk about um, gas expenses if you're commuting to work, which a lot of Americans are. It doesn't talk about any of any sort of work expenses. It just doesn't talk about it. It doesn't even address. Um, the federal poverty line completely ignores the healthcare system in America, which is obviously problematic, especially um, in light of a global pandemic. Um, healthcare can be very, very expensive for Americans, more expensive than any other um, developed nation in the world. Um, and it also doesn't talk about um, other resources like food assistance, food insecurity. It just totally um, ignores those sort of resources. It also ignores um, geographic differences. So it doesn't talk about um, really, it doesn't get into how the cost of living is more expensive in New York City than it might be in Carbondale, Illinois, or that living in Chicago, even within the same state, is going to have different rent prices, it's going to have different taxes, it's going to have different needs, you might need to like ride the train more often versus like here where there's not a ton of public transportation so you need to have upkeep on your car. It doesn't really take into account all those differences. Those are just the top three. We're going to talk about a couple more on the next slide. The FPL also has not adjusted for the changes of the standard of living over time, meaning you all need Wi-Fi right now to listen to this lecture. Um, to continue with your college courses, you are thrown into needing Wi-Fi. Uh, you need Wi-Fi to complete this course. And if you don't, you need, if you can't get Wi-Fi, you need to have transportation to get somewhere with Wi-Fi, in which you are risking your life to do, right? So, like, just changes this, like, came about, this measurement came about decades prior. We're going to talk about that in just one more slide. Um, but it just doesn't talk about standards of living. So it doesn't even like include insurance in the federal poverty line. So basic things that by law you need, the poverty line does not account for. Um, it also doesn't account for any learning expenses. So if you needed to buy a computer, it doesn't care. It doesn't talk about um, like expensive living on campus. It just doesn't think about our world in this time. So like, Having a phone when the federal poverty line was created was like considered a luxury. Now I would argue that this is a basic necessity that you need to like survive in the economic system that we have in America and in our larger global society. Um, but overall, the FPL completely ignores anything like that. It also still adheres to a very archaic measurement of family. So if you are currently living with like your fiance, your partner, your significant other, and you are not married, you do not count as a family unit. Um, and that's important because of the way it measures like assistance and non-assistance. So we're not actually helping the number of people in poverty who need help uh, because they don't fit under this very strict um, definition of family. So to be counted as a family, you have to live in the same house. You have to be related by birth, marriage, or ado adoption. Um, that's really it. So if you are like even married to um, your partner and your partner has children from the previous marriage and you have not adopted them as a step parent, um, you don't count um, as a family unit, which can get very problematic very quickly. Um, and foster children also aren't accounted for in the system, which is extremely problematic. Um, for a lot of reasons that we don't have time to get into. But this definition of family units and who gets help just isn't encompassing of what real Americans um, conceptualize as family or what are living as family today, um, which causes more and more problems for people who are trying to get assistance and just live in today's America. So you might be thinking, how did we get such a problematic measure of poverty in America? Why are we still using it? How did this happen? Um, so this actually, the federal poverty line happened kind of by accident, and we just have kept the measurement for decades on end. So this wonderful woman named Molly Orshansky, um, a Poland immigrant who was actually working in a social security office, so she had nothing to do with the agriculture department. 
um, came up with this number uh, based on the cost of living on Cold War positions, uh, conditions in Poland at the time. Um, and during that time, she was working with the best information she had um, and food cost about one third of the family budget. That is not remotely true today. Your budget is probably eaten up by rent or mortgage payments if you're lucky enough to have a house in this economy. Um, it just is not reflective of what is going on with people's budgets in America. And we have just like sort of kept this calculation. She just took um, what food cost, then a little bit of like shelter. Um, so what we would consider rent um, and like doubled or tripled the food cost and was like, that's what you need to survive. So obviously it doesn't account for Wi-Fi, cell phone bills, insurance, car payments, gas, um, nothing that you would consider basic or essential to like go to work or to continue your education is in this calculation. Um, this, Molly Orshansky is not a bad person. She is a Polish immigrant who was working in the federal government office and just came up with this calculation from the best of her ability at the time. And at the time, it might have been an okay measurement, but I think we can all just agree and recognize that this measurement is severely lacking and does not actually tell us about the condition of poverty in America. What does that mean? It means that a lot of people who are not counted as quote unquote poor are actually very, very, very poor um, because this number is artificially low, right? So you need to be in ex almost extreme poverty to count as can being in poverty. So with this problematic measurement using it anyway, because the federal government is using it, um, who gets to count as being poor and who gets to qualify for some assistance? Um, the poverty threshold for a family of four, remember family being a very limited definition, is about $25,000. Um, that means if you are working a minimum wage job, you are technically in poverty, even if you are full time. The government standards, that means by like other people's standard, you are in way deep poverty. Um, People who are working at minimum wage jobs, even if you hold down multiple jobs and work like a ton of hours, uh, you're still in poverty. Um, seniors living on fixed incomes are automatically typically in poverty. Um, if you are a wage earner suddenly out of work, you are automatically in poverty, meaning if you are paid by the hour. So a lot of you are experiencing that right now. Um, millions of people are in this artificially low category, meaning millions more people qualify as being in poverty. Just as a bright spot, there are better ways to measure poverty. Smart people have sat down and crunched the numbers and come up with better ways. We don't have to use this. We can actually fix this. This is a very fixable problem. Um, so you can start measuring families as like people who aren't married, but who are living together as a partnership. Um, Stepchildren, foster children, just like including more people makes that numbers more accurate. Um, as you can see here on the poverty threshold, it tells you that it's three times the cost of a minimum diet in 1963. A lot of things have changed since 1963. That is not our best way to measure this. Um, you can also just up update the thresholds by including things like insurance, phone bills, Wi-Fi bills, um, things that you just like basically need to function in this economy. Um, you can also do like resource measurement, meaning like you can talk about lump sums of cash. Right. There are a lot of other better ways to measure poverty. We just need to adopt them like as a government to like better understand what's going on with poverty. You might be asking yourself, this only makes sense if poverty is not actually being measured. We just need to make a better measurement. Why don't we just do that? Um, because nobody wants to be in power when suddenly, quote unquote, millions of more people are poor. It's not that they suddenly became poor. It just looks that way on charts, and that doesn't look good for anyone's political career. Um, no matter what office, no matter what party you're in, nobody wants to be the party in charge when millions of people look more poor, but they actually don't look more poor. We're just calling them poor when we should have done that anyway. Um, but yeah, there are much, much better ways to measure poverty and to actually help people in poverty and to talk about poverty and to understand poverty. So who actually lives in poverty is going to be a different story from the FPL, and we're going to talk about that now. 
So there is a feminization of poverty, meaning more women than men live in poverty. Um, this is for a couple of reasons. Number one, you might be thinking the pay gap. Women are unequally paid to men. This is still true, even for white women, but especially for women of color, they're paid even less um, in comparison to their white male co counterparts. Um, women also typically are still unequally getting the burden of child rearing. So if there is a divorce or a single mother, um, they typically get the brunt of childcare costs, which again are not in the federal poverty um, budget. So there's like no, there's no way to measure how exactly poor single mothers are under the government line. Um, there's just a lot of reasons. We don't have time to go into all of them. Um, but there are a lot of reasons that more women are poor than men. And even though this doesn't look like a ton in the chart in front of you, it is actually millions of women are in poverty in comparison to their male counterparts. In tandem with understanding that more women are in poverty than men, it also may not surprise you to learn that there are a ton of children in poverty because if their mothers are in poverty, the children tend to be in poverty. In 2018, 16.2% of all children, that's 11, almost 12 million children um, were in poverty. That's about one in six children live in poverty. Um, and that's just the federal poverty line. So that actually, that number goes up to about one in four if you talk about more realistic poverty um, metrics. And in 2015, this number is going to rise, unfortunately, with COVID-19 and has already risen since 2015. Um, about two and a half million children experience homelessness in a year. So when we talk about poverty, we also need to think about the people who have absolutely no power in the situation. Children are also in poverty. Another growing group of people in poverty are seniors. So we don't have census data for 2020 and with COVID-19. Um, I don't suspect that we're going to have good, reliable numbers this year. It's going to take a lot longer to get the census out. By the way, please fill out your census. It's required by law and would really help us um, understand the population better as sociologists and as researchers. Um, but one of the growing populations in poverty are seniors. Um, Basically, because of rising costs in rent and health care, and to be quite frank, um, the added life expectancy years, so people are living longer and longer, and thus you need money to go farther and farther for your retirement. Um, in just a few years, we've increased, we've almost doubled um, the poverty rate for um, seniors. So that's just an important population to pay attention to, especially. Um, with this crisis. Now I want to look at poverty by race. This is where things actually get very sociologically interesting. So about 11% of white people are in poverty, but disproportionately every other race is in poverty. Meaning that even though there are less people of color, more people of color are in poverty. Now, as sociologists, we would never say, like, this is a moral failing. Obviously, um, something else is going on here. So we are specifically in this lecture um, going to talk about why black folks are disproportionately in poverty in comparison to their white counterparts. To understand why black folks are so disproportionately in poverty in comparison to white counterparts, we need to go ahead and go back to the 1950s and 60s to understand um, the mortgage market and realtor market in America. So the first kind of vocab where you need to know is blockbusting. So blockbusting happened a lot in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, where realtors and land developers um, basically scared white homeowners into selling their homes at very cheap prices, uh, often by like saying black people are moving into the neighborhood by preying on their racism um, and they would do this in very devious ways so realtors and land developers would often hire black women to push around a baby stroller with a black baby in it um, or they would realtors would come to the door and like point in a nondescript location and say a black person has moved in um, so Realtors would like sort of fear monger and say like your house, your the value of your house is going to decrease a whole ton if you don't go ahead and move out now. 
I can't offer you a whole lot because it's already decreased. And they would scare white folk into, into selling the house at very, very low prices. At the same time, once white folks um, sold their home at rock bottom prices and moved further out from the city, um, they would, the realtors would then sell these same homes to black people at a crazy high amount, um, mostly above market value. Very rarely would black folk be um, offered a home at market value. And then on top of this, um, their house payments, so African American house payments, would be at an astronomical rate because the government actually refused to insure any black loans at the time. So not only were they paying an astronomical rate for the house, they were paying a crazy steep mortgage with outrageous interest rates. Um, and because they were black, they really didn't have any options otherwise. They were quote unquote lucky to be getting this house anyway. Um, so it just set up the system where realtors and land developers were able to turn a remarkable profit and black people like suffered the cost. In addition to blockbusting, um, a business practice that's pretty important to understanding poverty today is redlining. So redlining is where a company literally took out a map and drew um, basically squares where loans were considered quote unquote at risk versus like a good investment. Um, so basically they would draw red lines around the black communities and say that they were a bad investment and put green lines around the white communities and say they were good investments. What this basically means is that white people were able to get home loans and able to own their own homes and black people were not. They had to rent. They really didn't have um, any way to get a mortgage. They weren't really allowed to move into white neighborhoods. Um, and if you owned your own home in a red line district, your, the value of your home was significantly decreased. This is a real map of part of Chicago. This is a real red line map. This actually um, is up. You can Google these and see these. Um, if you are curious, this is just one slice of Chicago. So as you can see on the map, it's labeled green squares are A best, um, which are the white neighborhoods. B squares are blue, which are still desirable, meaning that there are not a ton of people of color in this neighborhood. It is still a mostly white neighborhood. Um, yellow is definitely declining, which is a nice way of saying it is mostly black or people of color neighborhoods. And red is named hazardous on this map. Um, so all of the red squares, all of the red lining is just where black people lived. You can actually see more maps of Chicago. Uh, Chicago is not the only city that did this. This happened all around the country. You can still see the maps where this happened. Um, you can actually still see evidence where people blatantly said, like, we would never give money to black people. If you are um, interested in this, you can read a book called The Col Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. Um, he actually goes into depth of redlining and all of the abhorrent practices and gets into people's individual stories and talks about at the systemic level what the government did and did not do to encourage this behavior. So a lot of things went on during the redlining era. One thing we need to talk about is the difference between de, de jure and de facto segregation. So de jure segregation um, just means like legal segregation, right? So there was a time in this country where legally um, segregation was legal and you could by law segregate places. But then of course, uh, Brown v. Education, Brown v. Board of Education rather, um, came out and said we can no longer legally um, segregate by race. So then there became the rise of de facto segregation which means there is still segregation and separation um, without legal sanction. And that's sort of what redlining is. It borders between de jure and de facto segregation, um, where legally people weren't saying because you're black, you can't rent here. But in reality, people just, realtors just didn't show black people, white neighborhoods, banks didn't loan black people money. So while technically not legally things you get, uh, sanctions still very important and still impactful. 
So this really ran rampant in the 40s and 50s and 60s. In 1968, um, there was the Fair Housing Act, a federal civil rights law that basically tried to ban discrimination, um, specifically tried to ban redlining and blockbusting um, in the sale of like rental homes and of homes that you can own. Landlords and realtors couldn't deny sale of a rental or of a home based on like racial reasons or like veiled racial reasons like blockbusting and redlining. Uh, but despite the fact that this act tried very, very hard um, to ban these practices and to stop de jour um, segregation, it actually really wasn't enforced. Um, and has really never been enforced in America. And Congress even weakened the acts like power. And you can still see this today. So even today, there are white neighborhoods and there are black neighborhoods, there are Hispanic neighborhoods, there are Asian American neighborhoods, right? So, and that is important because their grant, so your grandparents in the 1960s, if you are white, may have been able to buy a home. If you are not white, your, your grandparents were not able to buy a home. And then through um, inheritance, right, and through passing things down, uh, white people were able to gain wealth and equity and black people and other people of color were not. So this still has a lot of impacts today and still plays out today in the market. Let's continue talking about who else is in poverty. So if you think about people in poverty, you might think about people who are unemployed, but that is simply not true. Um, so we now have a whole class in America called the working poor, meaning people are absolutely employed, working more than full time and are still not able to climb out of even the FPL statistics. So this graph right here is telling you only the FPL statistics. So we know that that number is not correct and it's not counting for everyone who is actually in poverty, but only going on like the strictest government standard. People who are employed, about 6.6% .6 of them are still in federal poverty, meaning that a ton of minimum wage workers are in poverty, even though they work full time or more than full time. Not to mention things like not having benefits um, and not having health care. Um, another group of people in poverty are people with disabilities. So this chart again is reflecting the federal poverty line. So this is low, there are actually more people with disabilities in poverty than just um, here, but just keeping with the government standard, about 20% of people with disabilities are in poverty. Partly this is because they are on fixed incomes, partly this is because of work discrimination, even though it is technically illegal, um, there's not a ton of enforcement and also it's difficult to prove that someone didn't hire you um, because of a disability. Um, so there's not really a lot of enforcement going on here. And people with disabilities can actually still be working and still be in poverty. All right, now that you know a little bit about the demographics of people in poverty and how stratification works, I want you to go through the simulation that talks about um, what it could be like to live in poverty. You can get to this link again by downloading the um, PowerPoint that's online and clicking the link. You can type in this link longhand. You can also Google placement and I'm pretty sure it comes up. Um, this simulation changes every time you play it. So in your reflection questions, I do ask you to talk about what um, happened, what kind of choices you made. Uh, that's because the simulation, again, is a little different every time. Um, please finish this and answer your discussion questions. Remember that these discussion questions are due on April 5th and take care of yourself.